Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Very good to be with you this afternoon. Um, some months after the, um, the death of um, uh, Prince Philip, um, and the, the, the death was a, a very um, significant occasion in the sense that it uh, generated a, a massive awareness of, of, of the legacy of this person who was in the public life, uh, public life for you know many many decades. And one of the um, things that came to light was his work in uh, creating and forming the Duke of Edinburgh's International Award. And um, and we've had many many inquiries about. The, the significance of the award and and, and why it's um, you know, achieved so much attention. So this afternoon, I want to talk about the legacy of Prince Philip um, and, and how his legacy is very much contributing to generating a much more uh, IT savvy um, youth population uh, in Australia and uh, around the world. The um, just uh, moving through the. Um, the concept of the Duke Vember Award, and many of you would be aware of it, but not necessarily fully understand it. The concept of the award is that it's, if we're building it today, they'd be having a conversation around the table that they're building it in open architecture. And the notion of it is that it, it is a, um, a non-formal education uh, program and designed for young people to undertake um, with a lot of um, Customization and, and a lot of influence. And then when this aired, the um, formal education that they're going through, it provides a very, very powerful um, outcome and it generates um, confidence and behavior that does make young people savvy in whatever area they choose to uh, undertake. So people have now been describing as the, as the, the um, Prince Philip's uh, Duke of Ed uh, legacy as being enduring and, and effective. Let's begin by saying, the Duke of Ed is a tool, and it was a tool specifically purposely designed for youth workers and educators. And as I've mentioned, it was designed in what we call today open architecture uh, principles, uh, flexible, dynamic, not set with, with prescribed activities. And for the time, the um, mid 1950s, when this was being designed, it was very, very much um, uh, groundbreaking. Um, the people behind the Duke of Ed Award, again, we had a prince, we had an expeditioner, and we had a refugee. And uh, I don't use those labels lightly. Prince Philip, clearly, you know, he was someone who thought outside the square and definitely um, challenged what was, um, uh, you know, the norm at the time. And, and he recognised the power that institutions bring um, uh, to the table. And he used that power with very deliberate purpose and passion. The expeditioner there I'm referring to, um, the um, John Hunt, who later became Baron Hunt, and he led the uh, first known or recorded summit to, um, to Mount Everest. And he was the one that very much recognised the importance of outdoor education and the importance of the expedition for purposes of team building and, uh, and, and, and group dynamics and group skills. And finally, a, a very key person in all this is um, Kurt Hahn, Dr. Kurt Hahn, himself a German refugee, uh, left before the outbreak of Second World War, started a school um, in Scotland called Gordonston, attended by Prince Philip. Prince Philip was very influenced by his um, a more inclusive form of education where, where it was not just the academic syllabus, but very much uh, developing the, um, the whole person. In designing the award in this open architecture concept, they actually decided to have these guiding principles and these operating principles and so this is a feature of why the award has remained relevant and robust 60 odd years later. Uh, and it's just taking off in countries all around the world, well beyond the initial Commonwealth. And, um, and Prince Philip himself never expected it to um, have that much traction. So um, the key thing I wanna focus on the slide that's on now are the five educational essentials, the youth development essentials. And I'm gonna look at those um, in a bit more detail in a moment. But just drop your eyes on those because I'll, I'll be revisited, re, revisiting those um, uh, core five um, uh, educational essentials. But the thing I want to highlight, the bottom of the slide, is that the award design was very, very deliberate. It was designed to be a tool to be put in the hands of educationists, of youth workers who wanted to engage in a much more holistic uh, form of education. So for those that are familiar with the actual award, when we talk about the award, what are we talking about? We are talking about a framework. And it's a framework that 
only becomes a program when the activities are selected for a particular young person. And that young person may be working in a group, a small group, or maybe you know, undertaking the award solo. But the, the individual nature of it is that although the activities may be shared by a same group of young people, the goals, the personal best that they're striving for are very much based on the individual. So in summary, we have a four part framework. There's a fifth section done at the gold level and it's done at three levels. The bronze level is very much the taste platter. It gives young people a chance to um, experience the award and then they start taking on more personalized challenges and more individualized program as they do the silver and the gold. So delivering the award, delivering this um, framework um, is, is quite a um, complex process in itself. And what we use is a social, the social franchise model. And um, countries uh, earn uh, a license to deliver the award. So they get that like a master franchise for the country. And then in turn, they license organizations to deliver the award. So in Australia, we have over 1200 uh, what we call award centres, and these are schools, youth groups, community organisations. We have a zoo there. We have employers. We have um, uh, 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 prisons, uh, all delivering the award. There is no limit to who can deliver the Duke of Bed Award. The surprising thing for a lot of people is the number of volunteers involved, around sixty thousand, of which four thousand are what we refer to as certified award leaders. They've been trained to interpret and deliver the award. And the majority of the um, volunteers are those that mentor and provide subject matter expertise in the various activities that are undertaken by young people. And we refer to those as activity assessors. Um, just on the screen now, some, some statistics there. I won't go through them all, um, but the award in Australia, the key thing I want to point out, we, we do start around 30,000 young people a year at the moment in, in their program. But our ambition is to reach to 75,000 starters a year uh, within the next four to five years. And then, we're, uh, then we'll be well on our way to doing several hundred thousand uh, a year. If this program is meant to be influential and, and for everybody, then we have to be able to get to those sorts of numbers. Okay, so what has made it such a phenomenal success and in over 130 countries? I've already made some reference to it. But the very key components I've referred to at the moment are that it's multi-level, it's multi-component, and the other piece I'm throwing in, it's done over an extended period of time. This is not a sprint, it's not something done over a weekend or a week or a term. This is done over many, many months. Typically, we're talking 12, 18 months to do one or two levels, two to three years to do the full three levels. So that is a very key component in achieving the behavior change and the skill acquisition. And I do mean skill acquisition, not just knowledge of skills or, or knowledge of the behaviors, but these are behaviors that have been demonstrated, that they've been hardwired because they've been done repetitively over time. Okay, so here I'm just gonna look at the, break down the components of the design features of the award and, what, and why we, we build such savvy uh, young people as an outcome. They do it locally. They're not taken away into another part of the community, um, you know, onto an extended camp. It's done within their community. I've mentioned it's done over an extended period of time. Open architecture. The award has got no prescribed activity. When people say, I'm too busy to do the Duke of Edinburgh Award, we don't get that because the Duke of Edinburgh Award does not impose any activity. It's got the four areas, the volunteering, the um, skill section, the um, uh, physical recreation, personal health section, and the team challenge through an adventurous journey. But we don't prescribe activities so they can extend on current activities or they can take new activities or a combination of, and that's the open architecture piece. The award requires them to interact with these uh, activity assessors and these are the subject matter experts. And in doing so, they are building their networking and getting uh, accustomed to working with people that they may not normally work with or associate with. There's a, a regularity, the Duke of Ed requires engagement uh, on, on a weekly basis, although it does allow for some activities that have a, a longer cycle, e.g. Uh, doing an environmental project on the first Sunday of every month. Uh, there's teamwork throughout. Young people do the award in a team, <clears throat> although they may do their activities quite individually. Um, so it's a big team component, apart from the adventurous journey. And all along the way, there is a recognition element. The Duke of Edinburgh's award, particularly Prince Philip, um, 
highlighted in design how important it was that these achievements are recognised by the wider community. And he himself undertook to um, uh, promote that and, and be the, the champion of um, that recognition. Um, on the screen now, I'm not going to go through all of these, but there is some data there about what the views are of 500 senior managers who responded to uh, some research commissioned by the Duke of Ed. And generally, <clears throat> they've come up in, in quite significant numbers, um, claiming that the award does demonstrate um, the, these extra qualities and um, uh, the, these um, desired outcomes that, that employers have, that the soft skills um, and employers in particular uh, do see things like work experience and volunteering as being very, very important. Um, and the, the note at the bottom is a very important, a significant one for us, and that is how um, employers recognise that um, young people's CVs alone do, do not showcase, do not reflect what, what soft skills, what core life skills uh, they have developed. Whereas when they start talking about what they've done for the Duke of Ed, uh, they are more inclined to refer to those. Uh, another bit of research again, just for you to um, have a look at while I'm just addressing a couple of points there. But um, <clears throat> this is research about the award specifically. And um, so the key elements that came out of that were young people had increased motivation, a better understanding of themselves, their strengths and weaknesses. They developed greater sense of independence and certainly a stronger um, sense of self, uh, self belief. Uh, with, and these are all very strong numbers when you look at the 70 and the 80% that have come through. So um, in, in, uh, uh, this slide summarizes quite a broad range of um, university research around the world. So it's not specific to um, Australia about the benefits of the, um, the Duke of Ed Award. And they're roughly in the order of significance because as you can see, the last one, uh, reduced reoffending recidivism. Um, in some countries, this is really a significant thing. The award, for example, in South Africa is, is a, uh, very much used in the prison system and it helps keep young people out, out of returning back to prison. Um, that's a much lesser use in Australia. But some of the other um, uh, uh, um, benefits that are listed there are very, very relevant and very applicable to Australia. And um, closer to home, a Western Sydney University study uh, found these five qualities um, had very strong correlations with young people who had undertaken the um, Duke of Edinburgh's award. And again, these aren't any, any surprise uh, to us, and you're probably starting to see uh, a bit of a, a repeat in, in messages, but they're all um, the underlying qualities, what makes a young person resilient and, and what enables them to be savvy in the true sense of that word. Um, in Australia, we are increasingly having employers uh, recognise the award, and these are some of the employers that uh, have got um, the question on their recruitment form, have you done the Duke of Ed? They're not promising anything. Oh, one of them is, we know for a moment, um, Brisbane City Council, if you've done a Gold Duke of Ed, you get automatic interview for whatever job you've applied. But generally speaking, they don't promise anything, but they are asking the question. So it's a very strong public endorsement that the Duke of Ed is something desirable. Um, uh, an international study um, found that when employers are, are looking for things uh, in, in, um, in, in resumes, uh, apart from <clears throat> their academic results, uh, they are in order. This research found they're looking for evidence of work experience, they're looking for evidence of volunteering, and specifically, they're looking to see whether a young person has done the Duke of Ed Award. That one really surprised us when this research came out. Okay, um, I mentioned earlier, we, we're aiming to have this Duke of Ed Award available to more and more young people. And we, we're talking to education authorities around Australia to, to have the award more strongly micro uh, credited. <laughs> However, the important message is that the award in Australia is 100% scalable. So it is funded, self-funded based on um, the young people's uh, registration fees. It's a mod modest registration fee when they start the award. It's not an annual fee, it's a one-off and it's pitched at the lowest possible fee a person can pay to do a, um, a season of sport. So at the moment, depending on which part of Australia you are, it's around $160, $170 to do the award. And that funds our entire operation Australia-wide. Other than disadvantaged youth, we get all our donor money and any government grants we receive all go towards helping fund disadvantaged young people. 
So when we look at the young people themselves and at, at the completion of their um, award program, they complete an online survey. And here are four of the um, statistics that um, have been consistent uh, feedback from young people. 93% say that they tried something new. Now you don't have to do new things for the award, but you can see 93% undertook new challenges. 64% claim they feel that they've changed the person, 90% being challenged and 76% feeling inspired. So when it comes to our hashtag world ready, we do strongly believe that the award ha now has the runs on the board and can prove that it, it does generate young people who are generally um, uh, world, world ready. Prince Philip himself <clears throat> used the term uh, infinite potential quite, quite regularly. And uh, in celebrating his 100th year, he didn't quite make his 100th birthday. Um, we've adopted the infinity uh, symbol and um, because he was a champion of the infant potential of young people. And he is a recognized pioneer of non-formal education. He very much believed in, in helping his program, helping young people become savvy for the world ahead of them, world of technology, the world of, of, of um, change and uncertainty. Thank you very much for this opportunity to um, further share and describe those key features of Jupiter's award to you.